Welcome to Being in the Way with Alan Watts. I'm Mark Watts, your host, and today we're going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to share with you part of an interview that I did with Corey Allen for the Astral Hustle podcast, because I talk about some of the inroads into my father's work and ways to get in touch with some of the core ideas. And I lay this out in uh, three parts in my delightful conversation with Corey. And so that's going to be the first part of the show today for about a half an hour. And then we're going to listen to cosmic drama. And you'll see from some of the comments in the interview why I picked that as the appropriate recording for today. So today we have myself and Corey Allen from The Astral Hustle, and then Alan Watts from The Cosmic Drama. And I hope you enjoy this special show. But you know, whenever we were we were talking on the phone the other day, you told me about something that I thought was really fascinating, and that was that you were trying to identify these three inroads to your father's work, which would basically be, and, and tell me if I'm not describing this um, properly, but someone who perhaps had either no reference of your father's work or had some reference, but were looking for somewhere how to get to the core. Like the, what are these ways that you could really get in there and uh, kind of get the foundation? And what you shared with me as we were talking uh, was beautiful, but I'd love if you could share you know, each of those three inroads, and then we could just kind of talk about each one. Uh, sure. Um, you know, it's it's different now. Uh, there was a time when people had only read my father's books, and uh, when they came across the audio, they were just astonished. And, uh, you know, these were back in the radio days of the 90s, and even even going as far back as the 70s. But now it's, it's very different in that most of the people that come to the works have heard a little bit, either through social media they get something, or somebody directs them to a YouTube piece, and somehow they're introduced to him saying something that is very magical to them. So they usually come with a lot of enthusiasm. and But there's kind of a phenomena about it that I, I kind of compare to when Joseph Campbell's works were big. There were people who really understood a lot of his messaging, and then there were those kind of follow-your-bliss people. They mm. got that deep into his stuff. And and like this situation, it took a, an effort to sort of point them to what what would resonate on a deeper level. And as always, that's a dialogue. I mean, you you talk with somebody and you figure out what it is that's appealed to them. And, you know, that's that's the clues as to where they could plug in. But I after doing it that way for many, many years and having, you know, literally tens of thousands of conversations with people back when we had the 800 numbers for radio and then on, you know, email for years and then now with uh, all kinds of voice technologies. I, I've taken a step back and I thought about the way that my father presented himself to new audiences. And of course, I recorded many, many of these sessions. And the one thing that he would almost always begin with was the self. And to quote the title of one of his talks, myself a case of mistaken identity <laughs> and um, and and the problem comes about that um, uh, we we identify with one self instead of all of ourself and I think one of his best metaphors for describing this is um, he says uh, we didn't come into this world we grew out of it in the same way that an apple tree apples the earth peoples and of course, when we hear that, we say, oh, that's, that's great. I mean, we know that one apple does not represent the whole of the tree, although it's interesting, it can recreate it, it can reproduce it, but it's certainly fully symptomatic of the tree. And so my father had a, um, a, real, a real talent for and an interest in uh, dispelling, you know, what uh, I think in Buddhism is called the wrong thinking, but it's, it's basically this mistake that we want to over-specialize in the individual point of identity at the expense of our relationship with the environment, our relationship with others. The, the self seems to be pushed to the front. And so I, I've meditated about this for a long time, and I think this you know, reflective self is basically a stress adaptation. It's something we do as toolmakers, and it's sort of the ultimate psychological tool that we've developed as human beings. It enables us to do amazing things. I mean, we can build stuff and do stuff and 
as I as I say, you know, no no deer would ever build a submarine, much less get into it or wage warfare from it. Um, it's just something that that no other species would even contemplate. But we've developed this incredible mind, this incredible ability to abstract, this incredible development of tool making, and. Um, as my father pointed out, you know, back in the sixties and seventies, it's too much of a good thing. Mm -hmm. And, and then that was the other real key piece that he, that sticks, uh, in thinking about it is that, um, when he, he spoke about in one of the meditation recordings that thoughts were a good tool, but a poor master. And I think that applies equally to the self or ego. Generally, it's a good tool, but a poor master. And it also applies to technology. Because my father loved technology and it's like video and all of that. I mean, he would have loved to have a smartphone, but he would have used it very wisely, just as he used, um, you know, all of the communication media that he used to to spread his message with. And um, so, there's a, a few different uh, metaphors around this that he specialized in, and he he likened this adaptive ability to a spotlight. And he said, described it, he said, the spotlight is a troubleshooter. It's scanning the horizon, looking for problems and, and coming up with ways to, to solve the problems. That's what it does. It's, it's, you know, out there alerting us and, and all of that. And so he said, um, you know, we have the spotlight consciousness, but we also have floodlight consciousness, which reveals a much wider field or ground uh, of being. And, but it's only half as bright. And, and that little comment that it's only half as bright, I didn't even pay attention to it for 30 years. I mean, I heard it, but I didn't really think about the significance of that. But as technology has developed and uh, people have become more fascinated with it, I realized that that brightness, and I don't mean literal brightness, I mean sort of the level of engagement that we tend to have as egocentric beings is a, it's a bright, shiny object, you know, it's Silver bullets is what we're looking for. And so we become attuned to or used to dealing with things on that level, Th that there are going to be solutions, that there are going to be elegant answers, that there are going to be, um, you know, all kinds of things that are going to keep us engaged and um, moving forward. But if you think about the, the floodlight and the more organic process that we're really uh, all a part of, you realize that below that field of magnified attention, or I would, shouldn't say below, I should say encompassing all of that is, you know, the life envelope, the ecosphere, um, this world, each other, so many individuated centers of attention that all work together as a network, uh, the apples on the tree. And unfortunately, this overemphasis on this mechanism detracts from our ability to appreciate that or work with that or even resonate within that. And that's where I think as a culture and, you know, certainly worldwide at this point, you know, we really have some, some deep problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Just beautifully, beautifully said. Um, and that the notion of mistaken identity, the way that for me, how I you know, had the concept in my mind for years, and it's interesting, those types of ideas. You, know, you tend to have the idea first, and then it just takes a bit of time to to ripen and mature and kind of sink into the soil of the self where it becomes a lived experience as opposed to just a conceptual one. And the way I've described kind of breaking that free in my own experience was, of course, through meditation and realizing the information that comes in through the sense doors is simply just, you know, transitory data and information, right? And so, for example, um, if we smell an orange, and that's, that goes into our sense doors, we think, oh, there's an orange. And then we move on and we forget about the orange. We never mistake that that orange that was in our hand that smelled was an orange and that we were two separate things, right? Um, but then what happens is that, of course, one of the other uh, senses you know, of, of the mind, the, of consciousness, is that whenever the information comes from inside the body as opposed to outside the body, we mistake the arising thought that is just as... Um, ill-perceived as the smell of the orange. In that sense, it's shrouded in our perceptual delusion, you know, or, or in our, our subjective point of view. 
But yet we can't separate ourselves in the same way from our thoughts traditionally as we do from something outside of ourselves. Because since it comes from in us, we feel like, oh, this must be me. And so we go <laughs> on thinking that we are this thing for hours or days. And you, know, you would never have an orange and then go on thinking because you smelled this orange that you are the orange for several days. You, you know, you, you recognize the yeah. process, but when it's inside of us, it's a lot harder. And whenever I recognize that, I begin to be able to create that, you know, witness mind and observe not only my thoughts for what they were, but actually the whole fabric of my identity of the, as, as functioning in the exact yeah. same way. And that was a really revelatory and freeing type of experience for me. And I'm curious in your own life, you, you mentioned that it was through meditation that you were able to have some of those insights, but was there a particular kind of pattern of thinking or experience that helped you really break through and turn that into a lived experience? Um, actually, it goes way back. It goes back to a, a story that my father would tell us in childhood called the game of hide and seek. And, and he laid out a premise that's borrowed from Hindu mythology. He would tell us stories at five o'clock every day and our favorite stories were about these two rabbits, Thud and Zud. But occasionally he would get tired of making up stories about Thud and Zud. And so he would tell us about the game of hide and seek. And in the game of hide and seek, they're the great god and goddess and, and all played ball in the fields of heaven during the day. But at night when they slept, they dreamt everyone and everything in existence. So hearing this story as a child, it kind of stuck. And as a matter of fact, I had a conversation with my sister 35 years later, and it had sustained her as sort of a core myth of her life, this idea of the divinity and everything, but pretending not to know what it was. This was the cosmic drama, the game or the dance. But because I had that as, as a background, I always suspected something was up. So it was partly through meditation, but also an innate, uh, just an innate point of recognition that that came with that uh, training and i think it that's you know that kind of stuff is very important because the myths and the ideas that we grow up with become our common sense so there was always a crack in my common sense as far as as you know that went so realizing that there was sort of another hand or another player i i never was fully convinced of the individuated identity premise and so I think it was much easier for me having grown up with my dad telling us stories like that, uh, that it might be for people who, you know, never experienced that potential look at reality. Wow. What an, what an incredible gift and uh, injected into your ecosystem of thoughts. Yeah. And I, and I think though that uh, meditation is a, is a great way. It, it, it's, it's used to say it's important to go out of your mind at least once a day to come to your senses <laughs> uh, because a person who thinks all the time has nothing to think about except thoughts and lives in a world of illusions and because there, it's just thoughts upon thoughts upon thoughts and I, I look at, at thinking as a you know yes a useful tool but generally as an interference pattern I mean it's a little cycle that goes between our throat and our brain and uh, in our bodies, physically, physiologically, energetically, and it creates a, a little whirlwind of, of um, confusion and aspiration. All you know, Buddhists talk about desire, and it's what desire is is it's a misidentification of ourselves with that wanting or longing uh, process that that generates. And so I think, you know, in meditation, what happens is it lapses long enough for us to realize that there is a much greater system at work there than that little interference whirlwind that goes along. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always say that meditation pauses the story in your mind long enough for you to remember that your mind is telling you a story. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, you know, which my father, he loved that, though. I mean, he, he looked at all of this playfully. You know, it's sort of like if you're going to if you're going to play a play and, and pick a role, have a great one. Make an outrageous <laughs> one. You know, let's let's have fun with this. I mean. You know, he was he was dressing fairly conservatively as a, a teacher, or a professor at the um, Academy of Asian Studies. But when the '60s came along and all the hair and the beads and the incense and stuff, he just loved that. He just grabbed it and you know, and celebrated it. And it was it was so great. And I don't think it was like he believed that oh, you know, my identity has changed. I'm now culturally enlightened or anything remotely like that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a matter of balance. So I think the first great way into his works 
is the illusion of the self. It's, it's coming to understand and get a better definition of the self. I think this is his primary intellectual yoga, the way that he would sort of crack the box open. Yeah. Uh, but I think the next one is really relativity and balance. And it comes out of this self and this perceptual uh, mechanism that we see things by contrast. So one of his favorite things to do was to change levels of magnification in order to help you see that you were looking at things in a polar way. And I'll, I'll never forget, I was going through something with my girlfriend at the time, and I said something to him about it, and he, he didn't really respond. But about a half hour later, we were on the ferry boat Vallejo. He said, oh, you know, I've got to show you something. We hopped into his little uh, Toyota Land Cruiser Jeep thing, went on down to Sausalito to the Tides bookstore and went inside. And he used to go over there and sign the books for Bernie, the, the bookseller, because they would sell better. But we went in and there was a like a shelf of rare books, sort of a glass case with a thing on top where he had all these different geodes and fossils. And he went down the road. He said, "There, oh, there it is. This is the one I wanted to show you. And he picked it up. And there's a little cluster of crustaceans, you know, frozen there in stone. And he says to me, everybody there died more than 5 million years ago. <laughs> All of a sudden, my problems with my girlfriend kind of went, oh, okay. <laughs> he never even referenced it, but he didn't have to. Wow. And uh, so I, I think this is this is sort of the other, uh, you know, great gift is, or the great, you know, method um, is, is to see things by contrast. You know, whether you change um, your, your perspective in time, uh, as that did, uh, or just, you know, magnification, sort of the powers of 10 zoom type of thing, whether you realize that you're sitting here working on whatever you're working on. But if you zoom out that there are thousands of people near you and millions and millions of people around the world who are doing similar things or walking or this and that. And, um, you know, this is what's, uh, often described as cosmic consciousness, but it's really just opening up your awareness um, and taking the spotlight off of that, you know, little point of yourself and what you're doing for the time being and relaxing into the floodlight. And I think that this is really the exercise of Zen in many ways. It's um, to deconcentrate, not concentrate, but to deconcentrate and to operate in a state of relaxed but heightened awareness so you're more aware of your surroundings and and you know the other things that are going on but because you're not actually trying to force something from your own point of view you can relax it's not you know there's no agenda you know as you said the witness is is that kind of a of an idea to where you can can actually just be First of all, an observer, but really, truly, a participant. You become more mm -hmm. of a participant than you are when you're, you know, contracted. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I always find that that rebalancing the mind in that way, particularly if you're feeling anxious. I mean, it's good to do if you're just you know enjoying yourself as well. But if you're feeling anxious or or kind of tight about something or freaked out, and then zooming out in that way, it really exposes the absurdity of the facts that you're uptight at all you know it's like wait i'm this kind of hairless classy fancy monkey like stuck to a rock floating in the middle of infinity and i'm like you know of the and this rock has been around for three billion years and i'm this little w wiggly kind of fleshy wave of consciousness that like that has this minute little lifespan amongst billions of us. Like, right. why am I worried about like typing this email properly or whatever? <laughs> this is so, and it just turns into laughter because the absurdity <laughs> of the fact that, you know, as you mentioned earlier, how strong our minds are, that they can wind us up with a story that seems so real and right. so, you know, so uh, the stakes are so high, you know, that we get so <laughs> pulled into it that we lose track of just the true nature of reality. And this allows us to breathe in and out with our perspective. And we can, you know, at times, yes, it's totally appropriate to be completely engaged. And at times it's not, or it's no longer useful, or it's, you know, just adding stress to a situation. So you, you can disengage and, and uh, you know, lapse into another easier way of being. Speaking of the humor, I mean, you know, that's one of the, the beautiful things um, about your father's work is how he was just everything, even the most times, even he would get very serious about, and it was more, of course, to quote him, sincereness, you know, mm -hmm. not, not seriousness about something to really bring in the gravity and the kind of the theater and, and really land some big, right. you know, truth. It always resolved 
and laughter. And the, the, that laughter was always there right under the surface, just waiting to come out and bring and you know, put balance into the some of perhaps what could be seen as heaviness of some of the other ideas, because he was you know doing some pretty heavy lifting at a lot of times, you know, big philosophical ideas. And so I'm curious it, from your perspective, you know, to get into thinking that heavily and, and that complicated and also just for so long, how do you think that he kept the ability to stay light and to stay uncynical and unjaded and playful? I mean, that's such a feat to stay playful for your whole life like that. Well, I think he was with that core, you know, divine uh, uh, cosmic drama dance in, in his heart. And he was a very curious person. So he was delightfully going from one thing to another. Oh, my goodness. And, you know, Mark, I don't have time to read this book. Read it and tell me everything that's wonderful about it. I know it's going to be good. I mean, then he'd take two books. He'd give me two. And because uh, we fielded the mail for him for mm. a couple of years. And everybody wanted his review or his, his forward or something. And, um, but I, th I think that he was, he was basically with that game, you know, realizing that everybody was playing a part. And I actually was recording him at a seminar once. And at the end, I, I had to go up and get the microphone off him before he got up and walked away and, you know, would drag it with him a little clip microphone. And so I was right there when a woman came up, you know, very seriously and said, but Alan, what is going to happen to me when I die? <laughs> and he burst out laughing. And, and it wasn't, he wasn't being insensitive. It was just, he thought it was funny or it was funny how, uh, you know, seriously she was taking all this and just the expression on her face and everything. And he says, well, my dear, that depends on who's asking the question. Now, if you just identify this with this little piece of yourself who's worried about these kind of things, Fortunately, you'll be completely annihilated. <laughs> 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 However, <laughs> if you realize that that's not what you really are, and that you're, and he explained the whole thing to her, it was it was really beautiful. Oh, but he just amazing. he did. I mean, he just spontaneously burst out in laughter. Um, so I'm I'm curious, like as a a fellow often accidental social contact track breaker. <laughs> um, <laughs> whenever, for example, when the, the lady came up to him and, and said, hey, you know, um, what happens to me after that? And he laughed. Did he take a moment to then say, Oh, you know, sorry about that. And yeah, then explain. Yeah. Okay. Cause I, didn't said, I apologize. And I'm not laughing at you. It's, it's just, if you could only see yourself, you dear, I mean, you know, he was, he was so sweet. But, yeah. Okay. Um, I, I wondered know, if he plowed through or if there was a moment of, okay, sorry, let's reset. You know, it was obvious for my father's delivery that he never was laughing at anyone or he never spoke down to anyone you could just get the feeling from him that he was always playing with it. You know, he's like, it's like a kid in a candy store, all of these great ideas, all of these great things. So, you know, that, that really came through in his, his delivery. Really great. But that, that's, that's him in his core. I mean, he's the, he's the curious, curious child and he never lost that. He never lost that youthful love of knowledge. And as a matter of fact, in the, in the nineties, we named our radio series, the love of wisdom. Hmm. Uh, you know, for that, there's no greater love than the love of wisdom. Yeah, I, I love hearing these same core wisdom tradition truths that how he just, whatever the context is, just looks at them through this prism and spins it and spins it and spins it. And just the amount of angles and entry points to these ideas and how to unpack them from that is just, it, it is always completely blown my mind. It's a true it's it's true artistry, you know, to be yeah. able to see that many doorways into one central truth and then have it just basically expand forever. Exactly. And, and that brings me to the third method in. So, so far we talked about the self and identity, and now we've talked about relativity or scales of time and being able to see the contrasts in life. And and the third one is that really interesting because it, it really has to do with material culture. So a lot of people say that the spiritual world is superior to the physical world. Uh, you know, there's, you're a materialist. And his favorite expression about that was, Americans are supposed to be materialists, and they have the undeserved reputation of being materialists. 
know, the undeserved reputation. As a matter of fact, the entire enterprise is dedicated into turning material into junk as rapidly <laughs> as possible. <laughs> and so this goes to the Taoist side, to the, you know, working with the grain, going with the flow. And he had a great love of um, Eastern material culture, Indian, Chinese uh, art, and particularly Japanese culture, woodworking, uh, cooking, you know, all of that. And, and his essential attitude was that the material, the world itself, is, is in a way your greatest teacher. And, you know, when you look at something and you go with the grain and you, you know, figure out how to do something like, you know, put up a sail instead of rowing, this is really an intelligent conversation that you're having with the universe. The individual is an aperture through which the universe becomes aware of itself. And, and we need to be good students. We need to, you know, learn something from this relationship and, and actually manifest it in our lives. And so he loved material culture, teas, incenses, woodworking. He ended up living in a community of woodworkers. Roger Summers and Ed Stiles were woodworkers, his two next door neighbors. Elsa across the, the path was an organic gardener and a poet. And I think that the, one of the happiest days I ever saw him, uh, he, he would either come down to get the mail or I would drive up with the mail. And uh, he was supposed to come down, but around 11, he hadn't shown up. So I called him and I said, Dad, are you coming or should I come up? And he said, oh, come up. I've, I'm sorry, I forgot completely. And he was obviously very excited about something. <laughs> and so I got up there and he had rice paper spread out all over the deck in front of his cabin, which was called the Mandala. And he was doing calligraphy. But what he was so excited about was due to the weathered nature of the deck boards, every stroke that he did would print through the wood grain. And so it was doing calligraphy plus wood grain rubbing all in one stroke. <laughs> he was just having such a good time. And I helped him pick the ones up he'd done, and we hung them in the library to make sure they get totally dry. And uh, he rolled out some more paper, and I did a couple, and he did a bunch more. And, uh, you know, that just being with it that wonderful, wonderful thing. And I think, you know, this was very well known in the 60s and we've lost a lot of it since. I mean, uh, Gary Snyder did carpentry and, you know, odd jobs, you know, wasn't afraid to physically work at all. You know, it was a generation that was much more physically connected, you know, sculptors and painters. And and the, I think one of the problems that we have as we use technology more and more is that there's less connection with the actual physical world. You don't see these Renaissance men that can, you know, do mechanics and gardening and painting and woodworking. I mean, it's just kind of something that's fading away. And I think it's very unfortunate because I think our connection with all of that is a huge um, life meditation. And it's, it's a way of, of actually staying in touch. I personally love doing carpentry. And I work on some crazy buildings that were designed by an architect, Daniel Lieberman. And they're, they're like umbrellas that have been stretched with back walls that are uncurled swimming pools. I mean, he did wow. these wild designs and uh, he, he actually did them for somebody else. And then the project kind of fell apart. And, and I came in because my father-in-law lived there and, and tried to get it going again. And, but unlike rectangular buildings where you can go away and think about them, you couldn't with these. You know, they're, they're, they're like nests and webs. And so I'd have some idea and I'd come back and I'd look up and go, oh, well, that's not going to work. But just working with this stuff was just absolutely engaging. It was, it was, you were getting feedback on a physical level at every moment. And all of that was being incorporated by your entire being. Number of observations was always key to doing something well. And it's just a different process. It's, um, it's a whole process. And I think that he he really delighted in the connection with the real world. And mm -hmm. as somebody who you know, was raised in sort of bookish uh, life, you know, with a, he's a preacher, he's about raised to be a preacher, eventually became a preacher br briefly, um, but was always an intellectual. This was such a great liberation for him personally when he you know moved to California and discovered Big Sur and met these great uh, wild carpenters and, and crazy uh, musicians. You know, it was that kind of celebration of, you know, what we mistakenly call, oh, well, it's just the material world. Mm -hmm. But 
in all of these things, in all of these rich material enterprises, we, we do become more integrated. So I think that, um, you know, the old church fathers were pretty far off when they uh, were telling us to abstain and do not indulge in the physical world and to be as frugal. Uh, uh, one of my favorite things that my father talks about, and, and this is, it's interesting if you're into ecology, and he says, um, you know, the entire physical world um, is an exercise in excess. Uh, plants make way more seeds than they need. Um, you know, everything overproduces, you know, and we, we look at it and say, oh my goodness, well, that's so a few will survive. And he says, you know, the other possible perspective is that the entire thing is a great celebration. You could look at them like fireworks. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think that, that that's very true. It's also very comforting on a certain level because you know that um, it's just, uh, it's, a, it's beautiful. And if we can, and if we can integrate a little bit better so that, you know, we identify with other creatures just other than human endeavor, I just think we end up in a much more healthy place when you say, what can you tend to? I mean, this is, this is really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that notion of, you know, don't <laughs> indulge in the material world. It's like, well, we are the material world. It's not possible to not <laughs> indulge of it. Yeah, it's not <laughs> indulging. We can't not do it. You know, yeah, It's kind of keeping stuff together, you know? Totally. Mm -hmm. Totally. I've been talking to you about the mystery of the curious sensation of nothingness that lies behind ourselves. First of all, I gave you the illustration of the blank space behind the eyes, about the silence out of which all sound comes, and about empty space out of which all the stars are, appear. And you'll remember that in the last talk, I likened this curious emptiness behind anything, behind everything, to God, an imageless, non-idolatrous God of which we can have no, uh, no conception at all. And I've also pointed out that basically when you really get down to it, that emptiness is yourself. Now, it sounds very odd in our civilization to say, therefore, I am God, or for that matter, you are God. But you will remember, of course, that this exactly is what Jesus Christ felt. And he was crucified for it because... In his culture, God was conceived as the royal monarch of the universe. And therefore, anybody who gets up and says, well, I am God, is blasphemous. He's subversive. He's claiming to be, if not the boss himself, at least the boss's son, and that's a put down for everybody else. But Jesus had to say it that way because in his culture, they did not have, as the Hindus have, the idea that everybody, not only human beings, but animals and plants, all sentient beings whatsoever, are God in disguise. Now let me try to explain this a little more clearly. Because I cannot help thinking of myself as identical with, continuous with, one with, the whole energy that expresses itself as this universe. If the universe is made of stars, a star is a center from which energy flows. In other words, there's the middle and all the rays come out from it. And so I feel that as the image of the whole thing, that all energy is a center from which rays come out. And therefore, each one of us is an expression of what is basically the whole thing. Now, therefore, 
Whereas in the West, in the Jewish, Christian, and Islamic religions, we have thought of God not only as a monarch, but as the maker of the world. And as a result of that, we look upon the world as an artifact, a sort of machine created by a great engineer. There's a different conception in India, where the world is not seen as an artifact, but as a drama. And therefore, God is not the maker and architect of the universe, but the actor of it. And therefore, is playing all the parts at once. And this connects up with the idea of each one of us as persons, because a person is a mask. From the Latin word persona, the mask worn by the actors in Greco-Roman drama. So this is an entirely different conception of the world, and as I think I shall be able to show you, it makes an amazing amount of sense. So we start from the premise that you, and you don't know who you are, you can't see yourself, and as I pointed out, you don't know how you grow your body, how you make your nervous system work, how you manage to emerge in this environment of nature. And so this unknown you, the you that is not you, the you that is not the ego, this is God. That is to say, not the cosmic boss, but the fundamental ground of being, the reality that always was, is and will be that lies at the basis of reality. That's you. Now, let's go into a more mythological kind of imagery. Suppose you are God. Suppose you have all time, all eternity, and all power at your disposal. What would you do? I believe you'd say to yourself after a while, man, get lost. It's like asking another question, which is supposing you were given the power to dream any dream you wanted to dream every night. Uh, naturally, you could dream any span of time. You could dream 75 years of time in one night, 100 years of time in one night, 1,000 years of time in one night. And it could be anything you wanted. You make up your mind before you went to sleep, tonight I'm going to dream of so-and-so. Well, naturally, you would start out by fulfilling all your wishes. You would have all the pleasures you could imagine, the most marvelous meals, the most entrancing love affairs, the most romantic journeys. You could listen to music such as no mortal has heard and see landscapes beyond our wildest dreams. And for several nights, oh, maybe for a whole month of nights, you would go on that way, having a wonderful time. But then after a while, you'd begin to think, well, I've seen quite a bit. Uh, let's uh, spice it up. Let's have a little adventure. And therefore, you would dream of yourself being threatened by all sorts of dangers. You would rescue princesses from dragons. You would uh, perhaps engage in notable battles. You would be a hero. And then, as time went on, you would dare yourself to do more and more outrageous things. And at some point in the game, you would say, tonight I am going to dream in such a way that I don't know that I'm dreaming. So that you would take the experience of the dream for complete reality. And what a shock when you woke up. And you really scare yourself. And then, on successive nights, you might dare yourself to experience the most extraordinary things just for the contrast when you woke up. You could, for example, dream yourself in situations of extreme poverty, disease, agony. You could 
as it were, work on the vibration of suffering to its most intense point, and then suddenly, whoop, wake up and find it was after all nothing but a dream and everything perfectly okay. And you would say, wow, man, that was a gas. Well, how do you know that that's not what you're doing already? You, sitting there with all your problems, with all your whole complicated life situation, listening to me, it may just be the very dream you decided to get into. If you like it, crazy. If you don't like it, what fun it'll be when you wake up. <laughs> Do you see, this is the essence of drama. In drama, all the people who come there know it's only a play. The proscenium arch, the cinema screen tells us, well, this is an illusion. It is not for real. But the actors are trying to give us the sensation that it is for real. In other words, they are going to act their part so convincingly that they're going to have us sitting on the edge of our seats in anxiety. They're going to make us laugh. They're going to make us cry. They're going to make us feel horror. Even though we know in the back of our minds, even though we have what in German is called a Hintergedanke, which is a thought way, way, way in the back of your mind that you're hardly aware of, but you really know all the time. In the theater, we have a Hintergedanke that it's only a play. But the mastery of the actor is that he is going to try almost to convince us that it's real. And so, therefore, imagine a situation where you have the best of all possible actors, namely God, and the best of all possible audiences ready to be taken in and convinced that it's real, namely God, and that you are all many, many masks which the basic consciousness, the basic mind of the universe is assuming. To use a verse from G.K. Chesterton, and now a great thing in the street seems any human nod where move in strange democracy the million masks of God. And of course, here it is. This is the mask of Vishnu, the preserver of the universe. And you see, it is a multiple mask to illustrate the fact that the one who looks out of my eyes and out of all your eyes is the same center. So, if I look at another human being and I look straight into their eyes, isn't that curious? We don't like doing that. There's something embarrassing about looking into our eyes too closely. As if, don't look at me that closely because I might give myself away. You might find out who I really am. And what do you suppose that would be? Do you suppose that another person who looks deeply into your eyes will read all the things you're ashamed of, all your faults, all the things you're guilty about? Or is there some deeper secret than that? The eyes are our most sensitive organ. And when you look and look and look into another person's eyes, you're first of all looking at the most beautiful jewels in the universe. And if you look down beyond that, you see, of course, it's the most beautiful jewel in the universe because that's the universe looking at you. We are the eyes of the cosmos. So that in a way, when you look deeply into somebody's eyes, you're looking deep into yourself. And the other person is looking deeply into the same self, which many eyed as this mask is many faced is looking out everywhere. One energy playing myriads of different parts. Why? 
Obviously, it's, it's perfectly obvious. Because if you were God and you knew everything and were in control of everything, you would be bored to death. As I said, it would be like making love to a plastic woman. Everything would be completely predictable, completely known, completely clear, no mystery, no surprise, whatever. Look at it in still another way. The object of our technology is to control the world. To have, as it were, a super electronic push-button universe where we can get anything we want, fulfill any desire simply by pushing a button. You know, you're Aladdin with the lamp. You rub it. The jinn comes and says, Salam Alaikum. I'm your humble servant. What do you wish? Anything you want. And after a while of that, just as you would, in those dreams I describe, decide one day to forget that you were dreaming, you would say to the genie of the lamp, I would like a surprise. Or God in the court of heaven might turn to his vizier and say, O oh, commander of the faithful, we are bored. And the vizier of the court would reply, O king, live forever. But surely, out of the infinitude of your wisdom, you can discover some way of not being bored. And the king would reply, O vizier, give us a surprise. You know, that's the whole basis of the story of, of the Arabian Nights. Here was a very powerful sultan who was bored. And therefore, he challenged Shahrazada to tell him a new story every night. So that the telling of tales, getting involved in adventures, would never, never end. And that's, isn't it? Isn't that the reason why we go to the theater, why we go to the movies? Because we want to get out of ourselves. We want a surprise. And a surprise means that you have to other yourself. That is to say, there has to enter into your experience some element that is not under your control. So if our technology were to succeed completely and everything were to be under our control, we should eventually say, we need a new button. In all these control buttons, we always have to have a button labeled surprise. And just so that it doesn't become too dangerous, we'll put a time limit on it. Surprise for 15 minutes, for an hour, for a day, for a month, a year, a lifetime. And then in the end, when the surprise circuit is finished, we'll be back in control and we'll all know where we are. And we'll heave a sigh of relief. But after a while, we'll press the button labeled surprise once more. <laughs> so then, there's a curious rhythm to this, if you'll notice what I've been explaining. And this rhythm corresponds to the Hindu idea of the course of time and the way evolution works. And their idea is backwards from ours. First of all, Hindus think of time as circular, as going round. Look at your watch, after all, it goes round. But Westerners tend to think of time in a straight line, one-way street. And we got that idea from the Hebrew religion and from, in particular, St. Augustine. The idea that there is a time of creation, then a course of history which leads up to a final eschatological catastrophe, the end of the world, and after that the judgment in which all things will be put to right, all questions answered, and justice dealt out to everyone according to his merits. And that'll be that. Thereafter the universe will be in a way static, there will be the eternally saved and the eternally damned. Now, many of us may not believe that today, but that has been 
a dominating belief throughout the course of Western history, and it has had a tremendously powerful influence on our culture. But the Hindus think of the world as going round and round and round for always and always, in a rhythm. And they calculate the rounds in periods that in Sanskrit are called kalpas, K-A-L-P-A, and each kalpa lasts for 4,320,000 years. And so a kalpa is the period, or manvantara, during which the world, as we know it, is manifested. And it is followed by a period, also a kalpa long, 4,320,000 years, which is called pralaya. And this means when the world is not manifested anymore. And these are the days and nights of Brahma, the Godhead. During the Manvantara, when the world is manifested, Brahma is asleep, dreaming that he is all us and everything that's going on. And during the Pralaya, which is his day, he's awake and knows himself or itself, because it's beyond sex or anything like that, for who and what he, she, it is. And then... Once again, press button surprise. And as in the course of our dreaming, we would very naturally dream the most pleasant and rapturous dreams first, and that, then get more adventurous and experience and explore the hot dimensions of experience. So in the same way, the Hindus think of a kalpa of the manifested universe, of the man manvantara, as divided into four periods. And these four periods are of different length. The first is the longest and the last the shortest. And they are named in accordance with the throws in the Hindu game of dice. There are four throws. The throw of four, the throw of three, the throw of two, the throw of one. The throw of four is always the best throw, like the six in our game, and the throw of one, the worst throw. Now, therefore, the first throw is called Krita. And the epoch, the long, long period for which this throw lasts is called a yuga. So we'll translate yuga an epoch and we'll translate kalpa an eon. Now, the word Krita means done, as when we say, well done. And that is a period of the world's existence that we call the golden age, when everything is perfect, done to perfection. When it comes to an end, we get treta yuga, that means the throw of three. And in, in this period of manifestation, something is a little off. In other words, there's an element of the uncertain, an element of insecurity, and an element of adventure in things. It's like, you know, a three-legged stool is not as secure as a four-legged one. You're a little bit more liable to be thrown off balance. That lasts for a very long time, too. But then we get next what is called Dvapara Yuga. Dva, that means two. And in this period, the good and the bad, the pleasurable and the painful, are equally balanced. But then finally, in the end, there comes Kali Yuga. And this means Kali, the worst throw, the throw of one, and this lasts for the shortest time. And this is the period of manifestation in which the unpleasurable, painful, diabolical principle finally takes over. But notice that it has the shortest innings. In other words, if you add up the periods of years which they assign to all the different yugas, you will see that the bad principle only has the stage for about one-third of the time. And at the end of the Kali Yuga, the myth goes on to say that the great destroyer of the worlds 
God manifested as the destructive principle. Shiva does a dance called the Tandava, and he appears blue-bodied with ten arms, with lightning and fire appearing from every pore in his skin, and does a dance in which the universe is finally destroyed. There is that moment of cosmic death, which is nevertheless the waking up of Brahma, the creator. For as Shiva turns round and walks off the stage, seen from behind, he is Brahma, the creator, the beginning of it all again. And Vishnu, whose mask I have been showing you, is the preserver, that is to say, the going on of it all. The whole state of the Godhead being manifested as many, many faces. So, do you see that this is a philosophy of the role of evil in life, which is in a way rational and merciful? You see, if we thought God is playing with the world, he has created it for, its, for his pleasure, and he has created all these other beings than himself, and they go through the most horrible torments. You know, terminal cancer, children being burned with napalm, concentration camps, the Inquisition, the horrors that human beings go through. How, how is that possibly justifiable under any system where we say, well, uh, some god created it, and if a god didn't create it, and there's nobody in charge, and there's no rationality to the whole thing, but it's just a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing, then you're liable to say, the only out is suicide. It's a ridiculous system. But suppose it isn't that. Suppose it's the kind of thing I've described to you. Supposing that it isn't that God has all these victims and is uh, pleasing himself, showing off his justice by either rewarding them or punishing them. Supposing it's quite different from that. Supposing that God is the one playing all the parts. That God is the child being burned to death with napalm. There is no victim except the victor. All the different roles which are being experienced, all the different feelings which are being felt, are being felt by the one who originally desires, decides, wills to go into that very situation. And curiously enough, there's something parallel to this in Christianity. Very few people know about it. There's a passage in St. Paul's epistle to the Philippians in which he says a very curious thing. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not think identity with God a thing to be clung to, but humbled himself and made himself of no reputation and was found in fashion as a man and became obedient to death, even to the death of the cross. You see, here you have exactly the same process. The idea of God becoming human, suffering all that human beings can suffer, even death. And St. Paul is saying, let this mind be in you. That is to say, let the same kind of consciousness be in you that was in Jesus Christ. Okay, Jesus Christ knew he was God. Wake up and find out eventually who you really are. Well, in our culture, of course, they'll say you're crazy or you're blasphemous, and they'll either put you in jail or in the nut house, which is the same thing. But if you wake up in India and you tell your friends and relations, my goodness, I've just discovered that I'm God. They'll laugh and say, oh, congratulations. At last you found out. You've been listening to Alan Watts in Cosmic Drama. 
before that, we had myself and Corey Allen in part of an interview for The Astral Hustle. Our podcast today was produced in cooperation with the Ram Dass Be Here Now podcast network. Our theme music is by Zakir Hussein, courtesy of Moment Records. Thank you for tuning in, and thank you for your support through the Alan Watts Org.